before, well, right when we ended, I decided that I heard this song by Chris McClarney called I'm Listening. And I decided I wanted that to be our theme song this year. And, and I think for a lot of times we come to Bible study or we go to church or we do whatever. And the reason for it is, you know, we want to have bagels and donuts and be with our friends and eat peanut and ms and, and those are all really, really good things, okay? But I, I want this year for us to walk through these doors and say exactly what this song is going to say to us. It says, God, I am listening. I'm listening to anything that you have to tell me so that I can grow in my faith because that's what we want to do. So we brought in Michael Land. You've been blessed to hear him for the last 15 minutes. Yes. <laughs> he, is, um, he is our worship pastor at Christ Church of Fountain Hills where we go. Uh, Trent, our pastor, we always tell him, if Michael's not singing, we walk up and Trent just gets this look on his face and we say, Michael's not here today. Day, is he? And we, we tell him, we're not, we don't come to listen to you preach, Trent. We come to hear Michael <laughs> sing, <laughs> which goes over really well. <laughs> so I'm sure, yeah, he's really happy with you and me at that point. Trent, thank the Lord, he just rolls his eyes at us. But anyway, Michael is going to sing this song. We'll put the words up here. And I want this to be just like kind of quiet ourselves. And this is going to be our theme song for the year. So go for it. When you speak, confusion fades Just a word And suddenly I'm not afraid Cause you speak and freedom reigns There is hope In every single word you say and I don't want to miss one word you speak Cause everything you say is life to me yeah. I don't want to miss one word you speak Quiet my heart, I'm listening When sorrows roar and troubles rage you whisper peace When I don't have the words to say I won't lose hope When storms don't break You keep your word Oh, and your promises will keep me safe yeah. I don't want to miss one word you speak Cause everything you say is life to me yeah. I don't want to miss one word you speak, no, no, quiet my heart, I'm listening, oh yeah, your ways are higher, you know just what I need, I trust you Jesus, you see what I cannot see, your ways are higher, you know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus. You see what I cannot see. And I don't want to miss one word you speak. Cause everything you say is life to me. I don't want to miss one word you speak. Quiet my heart, I'm listening Oh, quiet my heart, I'm listening Oh, yeah Thank you See, isn't he awesome? Love to listen to him sing Let's pray Father, thank you so much for a new season. Thank you for Michael and his beautiful voice. Thank you for the women who take time out of their schedule to show up on Wednesdays as we kick off this new series. We're so grateful for the, the people that normally come and the people that are new today. I pray, God, that this is our theme, that this year we want to listen. We want to know what you have to say to us so that, you, that we can understand what it means to be a follower of yours. And, and 
it will change our life when we really get this through the parables of Jesus. So we, we pray for each person, each heart here today, that you would open our eyes to see maybe something we've never seen before. I pray we walk out of here today, God, more changed than we were when we got here. So we pray for that. Uh, speak through me. Don't let me say anything I probably shouldn't say. Uh, thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good morning. We are here. Oh my gosh. Okay, so here's the bottom line. Uh, if you're new, we, we never go past 10. We just don't. Nah, today might be maybe five minutes over, just so you know that. We got a lot to do today. Michael sang. We have a video. Uh, so we'll ex I'll explain that. Um, so here's the deal. Every year I go away in May and I tell you one thing. You remember what it is? I'm going to go lose the 10 to 15 pounds that I lost over the last like year and a half. So what I need to tell you is that didn't happen. So, okay, whatever. That's just like what, what happens every single time. I went to the doctor a couple months ago and um, I told him I was gaining weight and I had no idea why I was gaining weight. And I assumed at the time I was like retaining water or something. So my, my sister sent me this funny thing and I thought this is exactly what my doctor was thinking. No, you aren't retaining water. You're retaining Dr. Pepper, M&Ms, and brownies. <laughs> I'm like, yep, that would be me. All right, we are starting a brand new series called Life Changing Stories, The Parables of Jesus. Uh, the reason why that says the beginning on it is because we've got 31 parables. And I, mean, I tried to like uh, split them up. We're going to do beginning, middle, and end mostly so you don't have to you know, look at the same uh, set for 31 weeks. But... The parables are actually like how you get into the kingdom. What does that even look like? What do I do once I get into the kingdom? How should I live and act? And then we have a whole lot of end time parables, which is kind of interesting. I, when you kind of put them all together, you're like, wow, Jesus talks a lot about the end time. So uh, for those of you that were here with our Revelation series, Joel Richardson's coming back for six, I know, a literal six-part series in one day, three in the morning, three in the night. It's going to be super awesome um, because I want him to kind of kick off the end, end time ones for that. So that'll be somewhere February, March, blah, 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 all that. So um, all right, so here's what happened. This is what this series is going to do. We are going to, uh, we went to Israel this summer. Uh, we videotaped a segment from Israel so that you could see the land. This was our heart for you, to see the land where Jesus, you know, taught these parables. Um, so that was what, why we went there to do that. Um, each parable will have a short little, you know, five, six, seven minute uh, video clip so that, you know, you can kind of see what's going on there. Uh, today is a little bit longer because I introduced you the team. We have a cameraman. You'll meet him at the very end, and you will see why he is better off behind the camera and not in front of the camera. So we'll go with that. Let's try that. Here you go. Good morning. Before we actually start today with our new series, Life Changing Stories, The Parables of Jesus, we just want to say one thing to the donor that made this trip possible. Uh, we had somebody come to us and say, look, we know you guys love Israel. We love what you did before, and we want you to go there and do this next whole parable series, and we want to pay for the entire trip. So we want to just tell this specific donor that, that we just we can't even begin to thank you enough because people here in class, people that watch us from all over the world, they're going to be able to see Israel because most of the time people will never be able to get here. And we are seeing some of the most incredible sights. And, and for those of you that begin to watch this series, you're going to see lots of places that most people will never see. So it's all because of this one incredible donor. And we just wanted to publicly say, Thank you to both of you because you have just made this possible. Good morning and welcome to my most happy place in the whole world, Israel. If you know anything about me, you know I love this place right here. We are so excited that you are joining us for a brand new series for the next 31 weeks. We are going to be going through the parables of Jesus in a series called Life Changing Stories in the hopes that this whole series will change your life and mine along with it. Um, I, we wanted to show you this whole area because we wanted you to see where Jesus walked and where he taught. And then we'll be going down south where he actually wasn't, but we're going to try to tie in parables to specific locations so you can see this whole incredible land of Israel. Because this is where Jesus taught what we would say 
parables. That's what he called them. And what they really were is they were just very, very short stories. And that's what we're gonna be videotaping. These little short, tiny snippets that, that have an important spiritual meaning to it. But being here in Israel, the reason why we want to do this is because we want you to see that when you read the Bible, these are real places. There really is a Sea of Galilee where Jesus walked on the water and where he taught all around. There really is a Mount of Olives, which is exactly where we're standing on right now. There really is a Garden of Gethsemane just right around here where you'll see that in one of our videos. There is really a Bethlehem where Jesus was born and Nazareth where Jesus lived as a boy. The Southern Steps where Jesus actually walked up into Herod's big magnificent temple. But the most important part of this whole thing is that there really is an empty tomb, which is why we even come here or teach Bible or do any of these things. Because if Jesus didn't die on a cross and rise from the dead, then you know what? Our faith would be completely meaningless. But the Bible tells us that our faith is not meaningless. That right here in Jerusalem, which is what we will show you in this series, Jesus was, was crucified, uh, where he died, and then he rose again from the dead. And we want you to be able to see these places. 40 days he spent after rising from the dead in the area here and, and, and up in the Sea of Galilee. Over 500 people saw him. And here's what he did. He taught parables. And he taught them something really important in these parables, all about the kingdom of God. That's what most of these parables are about. And he tried to explain that if you and I are a part of this kingdom, if we are Jesus followers, then we have a job. And he's trying to explain through these parables what our job would entail, which means it's our job to go out and tell people about salvation, how people can come to know Christ, Jesus being the only way to God. And then it was near here, the Mount of Olives, where Jesus ascended into heaven 40 days later. And we're waiting for him to come back because he does a lot of parables on the end times where he will come back, set up his kingdom and rule and reign right from here in Jerusalem. So we are so excited to be able to show you this land filled with incredible biblical history. So I want to start really quick and talk about what exactly is a parable. But like we said before, it's just a short story. It's like a word picture. And, and Jesus would always use these word pictures of things that would make sense to the people in his time period. He talked a lot about vineyards or fishing nets, landowners, seeds, servants, bridesmaids, wine, light, salt. Jesus would use these things because they would be commonplace to the people and he would weave a a spiritual truth into things that he would be talking about in hopes that they would understand them even more. But here's the most amazing thing about parables is that Jesus made it to where if you were a seeker, if you were someone who really honestly wanted to know God, then, then the parables would make total sense to you. He would open your, your, your eyes and your mind to be able to understand what he was talking about. But if you were someone who was religious or self-righteous and you really didn't want to know God, then they would make no, no sense to you at all. Jesus did this pretty much on purpose. We'll read this in Matthew 13, 10. He said his disciples came to him and asked, why do you use parables when you talk to people? He replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That's why I use these parables for they look, but they really don't see. They hear, but they really don't listen or understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. And when you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear and they have closed their eyes. So their eyes cannot see and their ears cannot hear and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. That is what our heart is for this entire series that we're gonna be doing with portions taught right here in Israel. Because we want you to see what the early followers of Jesus saw and hear what the early followers heard in the setting where it was with him in hopes that this, that you have a desire to know God and, and that through the parables, you will be able to, to see the Bible come alive. And hopefully if you don't know Jesus, you will give your heart and your life to him and let the parables speak to you that way. 
the one thing you're going to see through this whole series is that in the day of Jesus there was religious people, religious Pharisees, the religious elite, and they were so religious that when Jesus showed up they could never ever get past their religion and because of that they missed Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through me. Please do not miss that. That is what this whole study is about. Do not miss Jesus through this whole series. If there is one thing that we're going to see, your good works will never get you to heaven. Your religion will never get you to heaven. Your religious zealous, zealousness, if that's even a word, will never get you to heaven. And the parables will make that very clear. So, to end our very first lesson uh, today, I just want to kind of introduce you to the team uh, because I want you to see who's here with us. And first, ah, my super awesome husband. For those of you that come to Bible study, you've probably seen Rob a million times. Uh, here's what you need to do when you see him. Go up and give him a big hug and tell him thank you because since we've been to Israel before and done this filming, we know what's going to happen. We are here in July. It is very, very hot. He is like the nicest man in the whole entire world. He's the one who's going to take care of us and make sure we, we, you know, he, he, he makes sure people are taken care of around us. He, he'll hold the umbrella for, for Eric, uh, who's videotaping. Like Rob, you know Rob. He just cares about everyone besides himself. So, thank you. He puts up with me. He puts up with my studying. This ministry would never happen if it weren't for him. So. I thank you for that, and just so you know that. Eric, Mr. Eric, he's our videographer, so you got to come up here so I can talk about you for a second. Here's Eric, you see right here, don't go away. <laughs> okay, here's Eric. Now, Eric was with us. I don't know why in the world he ever decided to come back and do this again, <laughs> because we, it's going to be hot. We do know that. And what happens for Eric is that he, he, once we get done doing this lesson, then he spends all this extra time and he goes around shooting all this B-roll, which is how you're going to see the land. He does that. And then for him, he's got to, that's, that's the easy part of his job. Now he's got to go home and put all the videos together, send them <laughs> to us. So there's a lot of work involved. So thank you for coming back and doing this again and your beautiful wife Paula we love Paula Yay, Paula. Paula here's what Paula does she makes me laugh but <laughs> before we even start any one of these she says this hallelujah it <laughs> makes <Paula>. me laugh <laughs> um, so we we love her she's a sound person so she makes sure that all the sounds right if it's not then she's gonna say Lisa, stop talking, which a lot of people like to say that to me. But um, she does that very nicely and kindly. And, um, and Paula is our prayer warrior. So if our sound equipment doesn't work, she just prays over it. And God heals our sound equipment. So that's how this works here. And then John. On, John, John is yeah. our, um, he's our driver. Right now let's talk about John because John doesn't know what he's in for for the next seven days. Okay, I'm a princess, um, and here's this gonna be. John, I'm hot. John, will you take me to eat pizza? John, I want something that's gonna be like American to eat. Um, John, I want more water. Okay, that's gonna be, so that's, that's your life, see? You know. And in Israel, if you've ever driven here, I don't know how everyone doesn't die because the roads are horrific. And he, along with lots of angels, are gonna keep us alive through this whole whole thing so anyway all that to say we are here we're super excited that you're joining us so from all of us welcome to Israel as we are journeying our way through the parables of Jesus Woo! <laughs> go from there. Okay, so I want to talk about parables a little bit, and I'm going to tell you something that happened when Cheyenne was um, in high school. So when Cheyenne was in high school, she played volleyball, and um, she, she came home one day, and she said, my leg really hurts, and I don't really know what the problem is, and we didn't either. So we took her to see a doctor. They took an x-ray. It x-rayed muscles. It didn't x-ray bones, and so what we realized, um, she said he put her on crutches. So we had her, her x-rayed, and it came out um, where she x-rayed uh, the muscles and not the bone. So he put her on crutches, and this lasted for like, I don't know, two or three months on crutches, and it, she never got better. We couldn't figure it out. So finally, we went to a different doctor, and he took an x-ray 
x-ray, but this was an x-ray on the bone instead of the muscle. And so what we found is that somewhere along the line, we don't even know how this happened, a little tiny piece of her bone chipped off and it actually fell into a pool of blood. Didn't even know this was a thing, okay? And, and, the, and the bone grew when it got into the blood. It was so weird and interesting. Um, but anyway, he said, we got to get the bone out of her body. That's what, what has to happen. So we set up surgery and they ended up getting that out. Now, the reason why I tell you that is because the only way that we actually found that particular problem is, is having it, um, having her go into uh, the right x-ray, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And, and the parables is kind of like that. It's like this, this x-ray machine that, that is going to touch inside of your life. The whole point is this, is that that's what we're, we're talking about in the parables. It's kind of like an x-ray machine that goes inside your soul and it's like, all right, it's going to do surgery on your life um, and, and change you. But here's what we need to know and you need to know is it's going to change you if you really want to be changed. And for Cheyenne, she had to want to get that bone out of her leg. She had to want to, to make that happen. Um, but this is what the parables will do. It kind of does spiritual surgery on, his li on your life. And God will begin, as we go through each one of these parables for the next 30 weeks, he's going to start showing you things that maybe shouldn't be in your life. Things like the anger or the bitterness or the sin or the hatred or the fear or anxiety, whatever it is. And he wants to take that and replace that with love and peace and joy and just p trusting him in this world. And that's what his, his goal is. And that's what our goal is for the parables to do that. Here's what we decided. You have to want to change. You literally have to want to change. Just like I said, Cheyenne had to want to get this, this piece of bone out of her leg to, to do that. So... Now, I learned this on the physical side. Most of you, if you know me, I don't ever go to the doctor. I'm always like, I'm fine. If I go to the doctor, they're going to make me like take pills or they're going to make me uh, take shots. And I'm like, I'm, I don't do either. That was why this is, this was, this is me when I try to take a pill. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Serious, that's, I, can't, I can't swallow pills. That's just kind of the way, the way it is. Okay, I don't even know how to make that stop, so we'll go back here. Um, um, but anyway, right before I went to Israel, I went to the doctor, and another lesson I'll explain to you why that was. But um, Rob went with me, and he went, and we decided, let's go get our blood checked and see what that was, which means a needle, which was terrifying. Um, so anyway, Rob's going to the doctor thinking he's dying, okay? I'm going to the doctor going, whatever, I'm fine. Every bad hereditary thing went to my brother and my sister, so that works fine for me, okay? Um, but anyway, he looks at Rob, and he looks at his chart, and he goes, wow, you are so healthy. Every, your blood's great. Everything's great about you. He looks at me, <laughs> and he said, I have no idea why you're still alive. <laughs> yeah. He said, your cholesterol is so off the charts that I don't even know if it's affected your heart and I don't even know if we can reverse the damage you've done. Okay, I'm like, thank you that Jesus doesn't say that to me. Okay, that was my first thought. <laughs> Two, my second thought was you might be a little dramatic, okay? But uh, here's what it did. It made me stop and say, all right, I'm listening. What do I need to do to make this better? Because, um, you know, I, now I take 10 pills a day. You should see me. I, I, I shove a banana in my mouth. I'm shoving the pills in. And then I have to, like, swallow the banana and then hope. It, it's a major production, whatever. But... Anyway, the bottom line is, is that that's what the parables are going to do for us. They're going to make us sit up. They're going to make us listen and say, wait a minute. I never knew that's what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. I had no idea what that would mean. Now, the way that, that Jesus did this is like, like we said in the video, it, 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 um, we have small, short little stories that have something to do with the, um, what he's used to, uh, the, the land or whatever it is that's around him. And so I wanted to say, if, it's kind of like if Jesus were here today, he would stand up and he would tell stories maybe about Facebook or about Instagram or about the internet or maybe about washers and dryers. This made me laugh because this is like my life. Okay, right here. Hang on, not, well, not that, but yeah, that. Wash, this is how I do my wash. It takes 30 minutes. Dry, 60 minutes. Put clothes away. Seven to 10 business days. <laughs> I'm like, yep, that is, but Jesus would do that. He would walk along and he would be in front of a group of women and he would say that and they would laugh and he would, because that's what Jesus did. He wanted to get into their world so that he could teach them something. He would talk about politicians or televangelists. Uh, if we were, if he were walking in Arizona, he would talk about saguaro cactuses or, uh, scorpions or snakes. 
snakes, rattlesnakes. That's kind of what he would do. So when I said the word snakes, it made me think of something. And I read something that literally, every time I put it on here, I, I, or every time I went over it, I couldn't stop laughing because I pictured myself in this scene. So Jesus would, if he was in the Amazon, he would tell the people a story about anaconda snakes because they have those there. Now, if you were in a volunteer for the Peace Corps, they would um, give you a, uh, oh, what's it called, like a handbook, and it would tell you something, what to do if you ever got attacked by an anaconda snake. Okay, so this, is, this, this literally made me laugh. Now, here's the deal. That is an anaconda snake. Okay, I didn't even know, that. I thought that was a joke. Like, I really did, until I started looking on, I'm like, Oh my gosh, these things are really real. They're, they're like um, 400 pounds. They can be 35 feet long. I was like, oh, okay. So with that in mind, here's the deal. If you're a volunteer, they give you this handbook and you have to be prepared in case that thing attacks you. Okay, so here's 10 steps you have to follow. <laughs> One, if you're attacked by an anaconda, do not run. The snake is faster than you. I'm like, okay, well, I'm sorry. I'm running. <laughs> that, that's my life. Here's two. Lie flat on the ground. Oh, okay. Put your arms tight against your sides and legs tight together. Tuck in your chin. The snake will come and begin to nudge and begin to climb over your body. I'm like, okay, you lost me there. Here's this. Do not panic. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm not going to panic. Right. Okay, six. After the snake has examined you, it will begin to swallow you from the feet in. <laughs> always, um, always from the feet in. Permit the snake to swallow your feet and ankles. Do not panic. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm like, I have just had an anxiety attack. Okay, just reading this. Oh, seven. The snake will now begin to suck your legs into its body, and you must lie perfectly still. This will take a long time. <laughs> I'm like, wow, okay, okay, so eight. When the snake reaches your knees, slowly and with as little movement as possible, reach down and take out your knife <laughs> and very gently slide it between the edge of the snake's mouth and your leg and then suddenly rip upwards, severing the snake's head. <laughs> Nine, be sure to have your knife with you. <laughs> okay, ten, you got to get this. Be sure your knife is sharp. <laughs> And I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, I would, I would die. But if you're in the anaconda and Jesus is there, he would be telling you a story about anacondas so that you could understand something spiritual with a spiritual insight into that. And I think that Jesus would make people laugh. I really kind of do. But here's what the parables are going to do. They're going to help us see life differently. Because see, you and I are born with this innate desire that says it's all about me. I want you to make me happy. Um, I want to make sure that you've taken care of me. You can't hurt my feelings. It's all about me. And we kind of, that's just kind of how we live. That's just kind of what we do. And Jesus comes along and he's about ready to do something for us. And what he wants us to do is get the me perspective out of my life. And he wants us to get into a kingdom of God perspective. And honestly, this is what the parables of Jesus really are all about. Many of them start off with, the kingdom of God is like a sower. The kingdom of God is like a man seeking a treasure. Like I was shocked at how much Jesus talked about this, the kingdom of God. Now I have this Bible program and what I did was I, uh, Matthew, I put Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in there, the four, the four gospels. And what I did was I, I typed in a word, let's say love, and Here's what, how many times these words are used. In the four Gospels, love is used 90 times. Repent is used 24 times. Peace is used 25 times. Money is used 28 times. Look at this. The kingdom of God 188 times. I had no idea that that's what Jesus talked about the most. It never occurred to me. I never saw that before until we started studying this particular um, series. I think it's funny. Pastors will always tell you, like, if they're doing, you know, a big church, you know, it, income, whatever, they're trying to get money for the church or whatever. They'll always tell you, Jesus speaks most about money, and I think that's probably not true. Now, there's probably things that's overarching about money, but um, the actual word money is not used that many times in, in the Bible. Um, I thought this was cute. A man died and went to heaven, and he was met at the pearly gates by Peter. He led him down the golden streets, and they walked by mansion after mansion after mansion until they got to one little shack at the very end. And the man asked Peter, well, why did I get a shack? And everyone else got mansions. And he said, well, I did the best with the money you sent us. 
<laughs> I thought that was cute. Um, but Jesus talked about the kingdom more than anything else. So here's the deal. If Jesus talked mostly about the kingdom of God, then we need to know what that means to us as followers of Jesus in 2019. Because if you are a follower of Christ, if you say, well, of course I'm a Christian, then you need to understand that you have a part in this kingdom of God. And here's what happens when you become a Christian. It honestly should change everything. And not overnight, but over time. You begin this process of changing. You open the Bible, it shows you what to do. And, and, and you're on this, like, this track that, that changes you over uh, lots and lots of time. But everything should start changing. Uh, how you talk should change. Um, how you act should change. What matters most in your life should change. Our purpose in our life should change. Uh, Jeremy Treat, if you ever want a good book, you need to get this book. It's called Seek First, How the Kingdom of God Changes Everything. And that's what you and I need to figure out. What exactly matters the most in our life? Because for a lot of you, you're like, well, I don't know, my work matters the most, or my school, or my friends, or my money, or my vacations. A lot of you, it could be the gym. Okay, that's not me. You know that. Like the gym, I don't even know what that word means. My, my son, most of you know Dusty. He's 21. He's a gym buff. He works out. He eats right. He does all the right things. But so every once in a while, he'll come home and he'll say, oh, I'm so sore from working out. And I say, I don't feel sorry for you at all. Like, I think that's just ridiculous, whatever. So one day he came in and he said, I'm so sore from working out. And I said, you know, I am too. And he goes, you worked out today? And I go, yeah, I had to go to Fry's. Okay, I walk, you know, fr fries, how fries is so, such a long walk now because it's got a big parking lot. I said I had to walk all the way from the back of there into the section where they have brownie mixes, okay? And I, I had to pick up a brownie mix, but I had to bend over to pick it up because it was on the bottom shelf. So every muscle in my body hurts too. Then I had to walk all the way back to my car, get in it, drive home, and then I had to crack eggs and stir. So I said I had to, all these muscles hurt me, you know? And, and Dusty just literally just like rolls his eyes like seriously. Mom, you're the weirdest person in the whole world. But anyway, Jesus says that the gym shouldn't matter the most and the family shouldn't matter. Really, here's what should matter the most, the kingdom of God. But most of us don't even know what that means. Uh, Matthew 6.33 says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not seek the relationship or seek the job or seek, like seek first and then God's going to bring everything else to you at the right time. Now, here's the problem with the kingdom of God, is that most of us think it's something future, which by the way, it is. There is a time when Jesus will come back, he'll set up reign in Jerusalem for a thousand years, uh, and then we'll, we'll move into eternity. There's a lot of stuff that's gonna happen. So there is a future reign to this kingdom of God, but there's also something that we do here on the earth while we're here. Jeremy in his book says this, this is what it means. The kingdom of God is God's reign through God's people over God's place. So this is why we have up here this whole, uh, the, the two kingdoms. And this is what I want you to see, is that on this side over here, we have the kingdom of Satan or the kingdom of darkness or whatever that, what you want to call that. And over here, we have this kingdom of God and we're depicting it as light and bright. And this looks kind of evil over here. Here's how this plays out. When you are born, you are born into this kingdom. People don't like to hear that. They're like, no, that's not true. It really is. The Bible says it is. You're born into darkness. You're born into this particular kingdom. So you're living your life, and somewhere along the line, somebody tells you, like, uh, you need to, to know Jesus. You need to, you know, you need to know where you're going to go when you die. So, so what happens is, is that you hear about Jesus, and you're like, you ask him into your life, and now what happens is you're moved from this kingdom all the way over to this kingdom over here. Do you see what I'm saying? So now you've moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Now, we see this here in Colossians 1.13, maybe. Hang on. Uh, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, right over there, and he transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, I brought a globe here because this is what I want you to understand, is that when you become a part of the kingdom of God, it's like here's you and here's the earth. It is your job as a part of that kingdom to represent that kingdom on this earth. 
Do you see how that plays out? No longer is it just like, oh, I asked Jesus in my heart and I got baptized and I'm good to go, I get to go to heaven. That's not what following Christ is about. And that's what we're missing in the churches today. That's what we're missing a lot of places today. People don't realize that the kingdom of God is what Jesus talked about the most. And he's saying, look, you live for my kingdom on this earth and represent me well. Now, like I said, when you first become a Christian, you don't understand what that means. When you pick up your Bible, you start reading, you kind of figure it out. But here is our job right here. It's living on this earth, but we represent the kingdom of God. Now, I'm gonna show you really quick how this plays out in the Bible. Because people are like, well, how did this whole thing start with the kingdom of God? And it all started all the way back in Genesis with Adam and Eve. God creates the world. He, he created the world like the kingdom of God, like that the, 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 the human beings, the human race would actually flourish under his reign, under the reign of God in, in the kingdom on the earth at that time. Think about it. There was no sin. There was no sickness. There was no death. There was no sex slave trafficking. There was none of those kind of things. There was this perfect environment. There was perfect weather. Uh, we see this in... Uh, Right here, Genesis 131, God saw everything that he made and indeed it was very good. I say perfect food, no calories in peanut M&Ms, no calories in Dr. Pepper, none of those things. It's like perfect, perfect weather, no worry, no anxiety. Like this is how God created this kingdom of God to be. And then if you worked in the garden, you're like, hey, let's go work in the garden. Okay, you're naked, you're running around because there's no shame. Like this is just this perfect world. And so God gives this whole entire garden to Adam and Eve. And I look at it like acres and acres of, I call it M&M trees, okay? They're beautiful. They're all beautiful colors. And they have lots of M&Ms on each tree. And all as you look out and you see, how could anything get better in this life? Like serious. It would, it's the perfect way. So God creates this. Adam and Eve should, should get the fact that God loves them and has created this for them. But God comes along and says, there's one tree, I don't want you to touch. One tree. And, and you would think that Adam and Eve would be like, hey God, no problem. No problem at all because you know what? Everything you've given me and done for me, I'm just so grateful and thankful. And, and so I'm, whatever you say, I go with. But the problem is, Satan, who comes from the kingdom of darkness, decided to come to Adam and Eve and say things like, really? Did God really honestly say that to you? Don't you know that God, nah, you might want to question him a little bit. And the problem is, is that they bought into the kingdom of darkness's lie. And it started this whole new kingdom. What's interesting is when, when we decided to build this, these sets, Rob, I, I told them, I ordered these two things. And I said, can you put the kingdom of God together for me? Okay. So he picks up a box and there's about a thousand screws in there, okay? And little pieces, and he had, it took him days, like days and days after work would he put this whole kingdom together. And I, it, it made me think that God's kingdom has been in the works and it's, very, it's been painful for God to watch this whole time. When he pulled this out of the box, it was all put together. It was simple. You just open it up and there's the kingdom of the devil, okay? So it's like, but it made me think about that when we were putting this together. It's like, it's easy to be in the kingdom of Satan. You just do what you want. You just ignore anything that God has to say. But when Adam and Eve decided to take that fruit from that tree, here's what happened. It was never ever about just eating a piece of fruit. It was about this. It was about who would rule their life. And that's the same question that you and I have to determine in our life. Who is going to rule my life? Here's their thought. Why be ruled by God when I can rule myself? And they didn't choose God's rule and reign over their life. So, so now this new kingdom on earth began and it wasn't the kingdom of God. And this new kingdom replaced the king of their life and it was Satan and it was themselves. And so now they wanted to be ruled by themselves and say, nobody rules over me. Nobody can tell me what to do in my life. But here's the cool part. God in his grace and mercy refused to give up on his kingdom project. And so what he did is he, he, he started this new uh, lineage. He started this new people group, the Jewish nation as we knew. No, he calls a man by the name of Abraham. Abraham, uh, you know, has a bunch of kids and, and through his lineage would come Jesus who would come from heaven, who is God. He would come down, die on a cross for our sins, making a way for heaven. He rose from the grave and it was God's way of saying this, even death will never stop my kingdom from happening. 
And it's been thousands and thousands of years, but that's the point that God is trying to make. And if you have given your life to Jesus, then you are part of this kingdom. But here's our problem. Most of us don't think in terms of living on this earth as part of living for God's kingdom. No one's teaching that. Like they really aren't. It's not like, oh, I'm in the kingdom of God. Instead, it's like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, whatever. Like no one's telling us the importance of being in the kingdom of God. Um, here's what you need to know. We represent the king on this earth. Secretary of State uh, George Shultz, during the presidency, the Reagan presidency, whenever he had newly appointed ambassadors that come in, he would interview them. And when ambassadors would re come back from their post, he would say, I want you to go over to the globe, and I want you to show me on the globe which country, uh, I want you to identify your country. Now, most of the people would go there and they would identify the country where they were going. And finally, one guy that was a friend of his, Mike Mansfield, he was appointed ambassador to Japan. So he said, go over and point to your country. He didn't point to Japan. He pointed to the United States. He said, because that is my country. And that's what we have to understand, this part of it. Never forget, you're over there in that country, he would tell the ambassadors. But your country is in the United States. You're there to represent us. You're there to take care of our interests. Never forget, you're representing the best country in the world. And that's why Jesus spoke so much about the kingdom of God, because as followers of Christ, we're part of this kingdom. The kingdom is our home, and our job on this earth, which isn't our home, is to represent the kingdom. Which is why I think that Jesus talked so much about this, is because he wants us to know that how we live on this earth, we represent the king. Here's our problem. We compartmentalize our life. We just do. Here's what we do. We compartmentalize our faith. We say, you know what? I pray. This is my spiritual life. What else do I do? I go to church. I go to Bible study. Um, I go to small group. And I help the homeless. This is my God box right here. This is what I do here for God. This is, this is kind of, this is my compartmentalization. Then I have this other whole side to me. I go out to dinner. What I do? I have my friends. I work. I go to the gym. My vacation. You, you get the picture here. All this. And so we come along and we say, well, of course Jesus reigns over my life. But I don't know that that's true. We say he reigns here, but the problem is he's only reigning over the spiritual things. I don't think, because when we don't think kingdom living, we think kingdom living means this. He just, he's just a part of the spiritual stuff when I read my Bible. He's not really a part of this over here. And the, and the point that we want to get is as we start on these parables to understand the kingdom of God is that he has to literally reign over everything. Everything. He doesn't want us to like compartmentalize anything. It's, it's like a 24-7 job. Uh, I'm going to give you three things before we leave here today. I'm going to tell you three ways how this plays out in our life. Um, the first one is this, it, it is, is work. We have to understand that God wants to reign over our jobs. And some of you, it's just the job of being a grandmother. Some of it's a, a mother. Some of it's a, you work at, you know, Walmart. I don't know. Wherever you work, he wants to reign over your life there because people are watching. Non-Christian people are watching you in the job that you're in. Jeremy uh, says this in his book. He says, if you went to church every Sunday from year 25 to year 65, you would spend 3,000 hours with other Christians. But if you worked full time from 25 to 65, you would spend 80,000 hours at work. And that's what God is saying. I want you to go to work, but I don't want you to go to work for yourself. I want you to work for me. I want you to represent me so well in those 80,000 hours of work, wherever that may be. That's what, you're, what happens when you're in this kingdom of God. It's not your pastor's job to represent the kingdom. It's ours. And some people say, well, I just need to go into ministry. No, you really don't. You have the, the most impact in a secular job with your kids going to secular schools. Like you just do. You come across people who really, really need Jesus. Think about all the people in the Bible who had secular jobs. Noah was a carpenter. He had to build a boat. 
Joseph was in politics, vice president to Pharaoh. Daniel was a student. Boaz was a businessman who owned fields. Lydia was a designer of purple. Daniel was a king. You'll love this. Esther was the first version of the bachelorette. <laughs> Rachel tended sheep. See, God says this, whatever you do, eat, drink, whatever you do it to the glory of God. There's nothing that says you should be in a ministry. It, you should get out into the world is what that should, that should look like. We should be the best architects, the best students, the best doctors, the best mothers, the best dance teachers, whatever. We should be the best. Because here's the goal. Um, the goal is doing those things to, to, uh, isn't to build our own personal kingdom. The goal is to represent God's kingdom. And no one's telling us that. I, I'm sorry, they're just not. And we have to, if you can get this in your brain about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, then it'll start to make sense. Like, wait a minute, I'm beginning to see what it means to follow Jesus. And this is what Jesus is trying to get us to understand. Uh, here's another uh, quick thing, uh, money. Uh, we never talk about money in here. And I really, I, we, even people will say, parables talk about money. I'm just gonna throw something out at you. Uh, Dusty, our, he's now 21. He ended up, uh, when he became 21, he wanted to buy a lottery ticket. It was when the lottery was like $200 million. So he came home at that time and he goes to me. He goes, I go, what are you going to do with your money if you win? He says, well, I'm going to buy a mansion and I'm going to buy a Lamborghini, but I'm going to give my 10% to God. And I laughed. And I said, really? So God's going to give you $200 million and you're going to give him $20 million? I'm thinking that might not be, be very fair, but whatever. So anyway, as he grew up in his faith and he started understanding about this whole kingdom of God thing, the last lottery, he, he, gets, he buys three tickets and he comes in and he said, Mom, I changed my mind. He said, if I win, I might buy my Lamborghini, even though I know it's not going to make me happy. He said, I'm not going to buy my mansion, but I really want to start a basketball camp. And I want to start a basketball camp to help kids and, and you know, find Jesus. And, and he got something that I think we're missing. Everything that is in our life has to go back to the kingdom of God. And it's not that God wants to take all of our money. There were very, very wealthy people in the Bible, so we're not saying everything you have you have to give away. But we're saying what happens is, in this kingdom of God, your desires start changing. The more you're focused on his kingdom, the more you're excited to give things away and to give money away. It's way much more fun that way. So it's not about you have to give your 10%. It's about you lovingly, givingly are excited to give because it's, part of, it's you being a part of this kingdom. The last one is this, sex. Let's talk about sex for a second. Being a part of the kingdom of God, even things like sex changes, um, not sex changes, that didn't come out right. Even things like sex change. <laughs> I don't know how that works. But here's why. Because God has done this. It's like this little refrigerator here. He's given us this manual, okay? So let's just say this is a, this is a little refrigerator. It's kind of cute. Now, if I want to know how to run that refrigerator, I'm going to get the manual, and I'm going to read it because I don't really understand. It came with a lot of different stuff, and I wasn't really sure what to do with it. But the bottom line with this is if I want it to work, then I'm going to have to plug it in, okay? And I'm going to have to shut the door. If, it does, if I don't shut the door, it's not going to work because it's not going to hold the, the cool air in. But what if I said, this is dumb, I gotta read that. Um, I, I know how to do this better than the person who created this. I'm gonna leave the door open and I'm not gonna plug it in because no one is gonna tell me how to run my refrigerator. And see, do you see what I'm saying? That's an Adam and Eve thought. No one's gonna tell me what to do with my life. I could do whatever I want with it. Now, I guarantee you that refrigerator is not gonna work the way it was created to work. And this is the thing with sex. God says, look, I have given you a manual, the Bible, and, and, and I've given you how this works. I created men and women. And I created men and women to have sex in a marriage relationship. That's just the way it works. But when you and I step up and say, you know what? No one's going to tell me what to do. It's my body. I'm a woman. I can do anything I want to do. I can have sex with a woman. I can have sex with a man. I can have sex with whoever I want, anytime I want. And we go down the road of Adam and Eve. And we say, you know what? God, I, I'm really just not going to listen to you. I know you created us a specific way, but I want to do my own thing. It's exactly what Adam and Eve did all the way back in Genesis. 
And so we tell people that and they go, well, God's just such a killjoy. Kill I'm like, he's really not. He knows that sex is best. I was just talking to someone the other day and um, we had this conversation about, I'm like, you can't be sleeping around and doing what you're doing. And this is person said, but I really thought this was the person I was going to marry. And I'm like, I'm sorry, you know what the Bible says. He's never going to bless something that, that he sa- he, he's already told you about. And so we got to get that, and it all goes down to sex. It's, it changes in the kingdom of God because suddenly you're like, you know what? I represent the kingdom, not only in, in my work, but not in only with my money, but now how I live my life with the actions that come out. We saw this. <clears throat> For those of you that love to watch The Bachelorette, okay, here you go. The Bachelorette was betrayed. In case you didn't know that, it was a very, very sad day. Apparently, I don't watch the show. I think it pretty much is the stupidest show on the entire earth, but whatever. Cheyenne was telling me some things about, about this girl, and um, so I got this because I wanted to see if this story came out, and of course it did. Here is what she says. Hannah and Luke Parker, 25, had powerful chemistry. I'm sorry, I'm saying that sarcastically, aren't I? <laughs> Um, But the relationship was never easy and ultimately imploded after Luke criticized Hannah's choice to have sex on a date. Um, I've been told, she says, that I misrepresented my faith. Says Hannah, a devout, not Christina, but Christian. Apparently, I don't know how to type. She says Hannah, who's a devout Christian of the fallout. Because so she's, on, she's on TV. She's sleeping with these other guys. And the guy goes, you can't do that if you're a follower of Christ, if you're living in the kingdom of God. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. She says, that has been soul crushing. But in the end, I'm not going to stop talking about the things I believe in. I can be a woman of faith and still be sex positive. Okay. Every Christian 10-year-old to 30 that watches this show now thinks that's true. And they're like, you know, why can't be a Christian and be sex positive? And I'm like, no, you can't. You can be sex positive as long as it's God's positive sex way he does things. But you see what's happening with our culture? Our culture is coming along and destroying everything that God's doing and trying to make it sound okay. And we have to stand up and say, you know what? If I am going to be a part of this kingdom of God, it's not just so I can go to heaven. It's so that I can be representative of Jesus here on this earth. Kingdom living has to encompass our entire life, everything that we do, and we need to learn this from Jesus. Because here's what we learn about Jesus. We think, well, Jesus was in ministry, so I should be in ministry. No, Jesus spent 33 and a half years on this earth. That's it. He died in his 30s. And he only spent ministry time three years, three and a half years of that. Here's what I say. I think Jesus swam in the Sea of Galilee and had fun. I think he hung out with people. He hung out with friends. He had his family. He hiked up mountains. He went to the synagogue. He had stepbrothers and stepsisters. He spent time laughing with his disciples. I can picture him after he rose from the dead. I picture him with his disciples telling a joke. I I found a joke that he would tell. This is his joke. He goes, hey guys, listen to this. Little Billy, a Jewish boy. That would make sense to them because remember, they're all Jewish. He says, a little Jewish boy was failing in his math lessons. So his parents tried to like get him to study more and he wouldn't do it. So they sent him to the Catholic school down the street. So what, the first day of school, Billy goes to mass and then he comes home and he starts studying. And every night his parents are amazed that he's like studying really hard to get good grades and they can't figure out what's going on. And so at the very end, he gets his report card, he gets an A and his parents said, what changed? What is it in you that changed? Was it, you know, was it a new teacher? Was it a new school book? And he said, no. He said, it was really interesting. The first day of school, it's a Catholic school, I looked up on the wall and I saw this man hanging on a plus sign. And he said, I realized then (laughs) that they took math really seriously around here. (laughs) So he studied really hard, okay. That was the cross. I thought that was really funny. Okay, but you can imagine Jesus telling this and then the disciples are laughing because he's trying to make a, a, a joke out of things, whatever. But here's what you need to know. Most of your life is not going to be spent in a small group or church. Most of your life is going to be spent out into the world, um, and you're going to be living out the kingdom of God to those around us. That's just the way this whole thing works. And it all goes back to what Jesus is teaching us in the parables, that if you become a follower of his, it's not just so you can go to heaven. It's not just so you can become a good moral person. It really is. Everything in your life changes. Why? Why? Because you're going from living for your own kingdom 
to living for the kingdom of God. That's just what changes, and that's what has to happen if you and I say that we're followers of Christ. Paul talks about this in Thessalonians. He says, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you would what? Walk in a manner worthy of the God who called you into his own kingdom and glory. That's a great verse. He called you into this kingdom. Now it's our job to go represent him well. And here's what we're going to learn in the parables, that as we start working through there, we're going to be getting to understand this kingdom of God. And what happens is, this is our hope, that we become more kingdom-minded. And when you're more kingdom-minded, you really honestly, this is weird, you worry less, you forgive more, you trust God with everything, you don't fall apart when something bad happens, because honestly you go, you know what, I'm a child of the king, and he knows exactly what I need. And so if, if that job doesn't work out or that relationship doesn't work out or that whatever doesn't work out, you say, you know what, he's, he's, I, I'm under in this kingdom. He's protecting me. He's helping me. He's there for me. I don't need to worry about anything. And there's something that's so peaceful about that when that happens. So there you go. Here's our last thing. We live for and are taken care of by the king in this kingdom. And when you get that full-heartedly, it will change your life so drastically, nothing will affect you. You're like, oh, I have cancer. Okay, God, I live in your kingdom. What do you want me to do about this? Oh, the guy broke up with me. Okay, God, what do you want me to do with this? Because you know what? I'm in your kingdom. Everything goes back to, God, I live for you in your kingdom. So here's what I want us to do as we end. I want you to look at your faith not as like a, a, a jar where you're compartmentalizing everything. I want us to look as everything we do on this earth, okay, for the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus is going to be telling us in these parables. And I just want to say this as we end really quick. If you're not a Christian here, if someone just brought you and you're like, well, I thought I was, you know, I thought I asked, you know, I thought I was a Christian because I went to church. I want you to know that Asking Jesus in your heart is the most important thing you'll ever do. Because like the verse we said, it will move you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God. And you will spend eternity with him. You will reign with him on this earth forever. This is what the kingdom of God will bring to you. If you don't know him, here's what I say. It's so simple. You say, Jesus, come into my life. I want to start kingdom living. I just do. I don't want to live in the kingdom of darkness any longer. And it's really simple. And you have to come to that point in your life and just say, God, I'm giving you my life. Father, thank you so much for this, this day today. Um, thank you for what you're teaching us about the kingdom of God. God, this is so different from what we're taught normally. Uh, most of us are just taught that we just ask you in our heart and we're just good to go. But God, help us during the next 30 weeks that we see from the words of Jesus in the parables that he says what it means to be a follower of his representing this kingdom on this earth. God, I pray you will change us. That we walk in these doors every day and we say, God, I'm listening. Change my heart. We want to be good kingdom people on this earth so that we can represent you well. If someone doesn't know you, I pray today's the day they give their life to you. In Jesus' name, amen.